Really, Dad? Mom is right. You really are an asshole. That's the last thing I heard from my daughter when I hung up. Oh, she tried sending me text messages over the next few days, but I just deleted them. There were even a couple of voicemails, but I deleted them after hearing the first couple of words. It was all the same. These were simply the words of my ex-wife, spoken in my daughter's voice. She made her choice ten years ago and came to terms with this decision. This so-called olive branch was just an insult. So I'm Tom Williams. I was previously married to Kayla Williams. We had been married for about 17 years when everything fell apart. Of course, they blamed me for this. This is what happens to the naive simpletons in our wonderful divorce courts in this country. They blame the man and then let the ex-wife get full custody so she can tell the kids what a terrible person their father is. I swear, the divorce laws in this country were written by a bunch of man-hating feminists who want to fuck anyone with a man's dignity. Like I said, we were married for 17 years. We had two children, a 14-year-old son, and a 16-year-old daughter. I thought everything was going great. I loved my wife and was sure that she loved me. Our children were smart, athletic, well-mannered, and good-looking. Carly was a daddy's girl, and Josh was a friendly and athletic boy. I was making decent money as a mechanical engineer, and Kayla had a good job as an accountant. We both played sports to keep fit and were both pretty good-looking. Like I said, Carly was a daddy's girl through and through. She seemed to worship me, and I was wrapped around her little finger. She was good at math and science and decided that she would be an engineer like her dad. She received her driver's license the day she turned 16. She, like me, loved to drive a car. From the age of 10, she would go into the garage handing me wrenches while I worked on the various toys I purchased. I'm an unashamed tech lover. I like old cars, mostly GM ones that I can tinker with and build. She also developed my love for them. Some weekends we would go to car shows together and spend the entire day drooling over these amazing cars. It just seemed like we were together almost every weekend. I was also quite skilled at household chores. Carly was always happy to help me when I did things around the house. I taught her the basics of plumbing, electrical, drywall, and painting. She was by my side when I installed new appliances. She even helped me with a new concrete slab that I placed next to my workshop. Although Carly turned to her mother on women's issues, which I was very happy about, it was to me that she came for advice and help in everything else. Homework, drama with girlfriends, advice on what she's going to do, boys, etc. We were very open and honest with each other. When she had troubles, she turned to me for help. I was a daddy's girl and Kayla was a mama's boy. Josh was never into cars and mechanics like his older sister. He was a good student, but science did not interest him much. He excelled more in English, literature, and civics. He started talking about becoming a lawyer. Of course, Josh and I also talked, but he seemed to be more attached to his mom than to me. The last couple of weeks, Kayla seemed a little off. Nothing special, she just seemed a little distant. And lately, she seemed to zone out for a minute or two. I asked her a couple of times if everything was okay, but she just brushed me off and ignored my concerns. Usually, I liked it when she told me off, but this was not the case. Again, nothing special, just a little off. It was Friday evening. I just returned home from work. It was six gao, as it always was when I got home on a Friday night. I saw that Kayla, as usual, was already at home. I walked through the door and shouted that I was home, as always. Oddly enough, there were no smells of dinner being prepared. Also, Carly didn't come down and greet me. Of course, she is already a teenager, but she usually greets me if she is at home. She and Josh must still be hanging out with friends. Well, I put my briefcase in my office and went upstairs to change into more comfortable clothes for the evening. When I entered the bedroom, I saw that my wife had laid out her LBD on the table little black dress, sexy lingerie, stockings and garters, as well as their six-inch CFM shoes. This explained the lack of smell for dinner. Apparently, we were planning on going out tonight instead. I wish she had warned me about this, but I still didn't make any other plans. Kayla was still in the bathroom putting on her makeup when I entered. Where are we going, darling? I asked starting to take off my shirt. We're not going anywhere, she replied. It was strange. Well, 
if we're not going anywhere, why did you put on makeup and lay out a sexy outfit on the bed? I said that we are not going anywhere. I'm coming. Is it true? And where do you think you will go in such an outfit without me? Also, where are the children? I had a bad feeling. Children spend the night with friends. I don't know exactly where my boyfriend will take me, but most likely I won't be home until tomorrow morning. What do you mean, your gentleman? And you won't be back until the morning? Exactly what I said. I have a date tonight, and if everything goes according to plan, I'll spend the night with him, she said calmly. You are crazy. What the hell makes you think I'll even put up with this for a second? To hell with all of it. If you want to go out and have fun, you can wait until the fucking divorce is final. Stop being stupid. There will be no divorce. I'll just do it once and then everything will go back to normal. I need this night. We've been married for 17 years and I just need to go out once to prove to myself that I'm still attractive to other guys. If you really love me, you'll let me have this night and it won't even show up on the radar. Well, if you really loved me, you wouldn't even think about it. I love you, but I need it. I'm getting older and I need to feel like I'm still attractive to other men, especially for young men. Clarence is about 10 years younger than me. He's been flirting with me for the past six months, and I finally decided to accept his proposal. It's just one night of sex to convince myself that I'm still a sexy woman attractive to other men. For me, it's just a confidence boost. I've noticed a few wrinkles and a couple of gray hairs that are starting to show through, and I need to boost my ego. I do not need this, and I am not going to put up with it. Do you remember that part of the wedding vows about forsaking all others? You do this, and you break your vows. Don't be stupid. It's just for one night. After returning home, I will never do this again. I promise. Are you a fool, or do you believe that I'm a fool? After breaking the vow you made to me in front of God, family, and friends, do you really expect me to believe your simple promise made in private? Simply put, if you do this, it's over between us. You walk out the door, and I will meet with the lawyer as quickly as possible. Don't be an idiot. There will be no divorce. I will return home and be the loving, faithful wife I always have been. If you try to divorce me, I will fight as long and hard as I can. As a result, you will lose your house, most of your property, and I will get full custody of the children. Moreover, I will do everything possible to disrupt your visits and I will place all the blame for the breakup of the family on you. I will do everything so that your children will eventually hate you. I was shocked by her words. You claim that you love me, but at the same time, you are ready to do all this to me? Damn right, I'll do it. I love you, but if you try to divorce me, I will fight you. I don't want to lose you, so I'm just telling you the consequences of actions. Look, I told you, that I just need one night to prove that I'm still attractive and sexy. Yes, but what will happen in a few more years? What happens next time you start to think you're still getting old and wonder if you can still attract a younger man? Let me guess. The gossip around Cooler says he's a great lover. I bet he had sex with every single one of your employees. I promise that this won't happen. And yes, there were a few gossips that I overheard. I admit I'm curious but it will just be sex. There will be no love. You have nothing to fear that he will take me from you. Like I said, this is just a one-time thing to get it all out of my head. Maybe I'll even learn something that will spice up our sex life. A couple of new tricks will spice up our lovemaking. If you follow through with this, I have already told you the consequences of your actions. If you call him right now and cancel the appointment, we can go to marriage counseling and work on saving our marriage. Don't be stupid, we'll be fine. If you really insist on counseling to heal your bruised little ego, we can talk about it tomorrow when I get back. With these words, she continued to prepare for the date. I changed into jeans and a t-shirt and left the room. After a while, she came downstairs, dressed in the clothes she had laid out. She had a small clutch in her hands and was examining herself in the mirror by the door. I was sitting in my chair in the living room. A car horn was heard outside. He is here. I have to go. I'll see you in the morning, she said, 
coming up to me to kiss me goodbye. I turned my head and pulled away from her. She ended up kissing the air. She straightened up and looked at me with a frown. Okay, so be it. Once you get over your little tantrum, everything will go back to normal. With these words, she turned and headed towards the door. I turned to her with one last request. If you walk out the door, it's over between us. You better think twice about throwing 17 years of marriage away. She turned to look at me. I don't throw anything away. Like I said, I'll be back and everything will be back to normal. With these words, she opened the door and went out. Yes, I began to cry over the loss of my marriage and the woman I had loved exclusively for the past 20 years. 17 years of marriage, a year of engagement, and two years of exclusive dating. I didn't understand how she could do this to me. She never expressed dissatisfaction with me. We had a normal sex life, and she never said she wanted more. I would happily give her more if that's what she wanted. We didn't quarrel over anything. Of course, there were some disagreements, like all couples. Nevertheless, we discussed everything and came to a mutual agreement. I've already decided what I'll do if she goes for it. Half an hour later, I finally got up and got to work. I think I waited that half hour for her to come to her senses and come back. Obviously, this didn't happen. I went upstairs and began to implement my plan. It wasn't a great plan, but it was the best I could do at the time. It was a fairly large house with four bedrooms. Master bedroom, Carly's room, Josh's room, and a large guest bedroom. The guest bedroom was actually the master's second bedroom with a private bathroom. We used it when her family or my family came over. We also used it for kids' sleepovers. This will now be my temporary bedroom. It took me about two hours to completely move from our old bedroom to my new one. I had no illusions about what would happen in our divorce. It was a no-fault state. This means that the divorce laws in this state were written by man-hating feminists. In general, unless the wife was convicted of some serious crime and sent to prison for at least ten years, all the blame fell on him. It didn't matter whether the husband was a completely innocent victim, the wife ended up getting the house, the children, alimony, maintenance, and the husband was left with all the bills. She gets a gold mine, and he gets a mine. After getting my new temporary home in order, I went down to my home office and logged into our online banking. A few years ago, I opened another account in my name. It wasn't for any nefarious purpose. It was just that I could buy her gifts, and she would be surprised. We both had access to our finances, and there were a few times when she came in to check on our finances and happened to see a purchase I was making for her. Needless to say, there were no surprises for her birthday or Christmas, so I opened a new account in my name only so I could buy her gifts and not let her know what she was getting in advance. Now I decided to repurpose this account. She knew about him, but had no access to him. First, I transferred exactly half of our checking and savings accounts to my personal account. Second, using the remaining money in the joint account, I paid off and canceled all of our credit cards. Then I signed up for several new cards in my name only. Yes, I should have paid off everything before transferring the money, but I decided that it would be better to pay back everything that the court ordered me to do than to try to collect anything from her. I would transfer my direct deposit from work to my personal account on Monday morning when I got to work. Also, on Monday, I will have to call our broker and ask to split our investment. Having done all I could, I grabbed another glass of Jim Beam with ice and headed to my room for the night. I finished my drink, getting ready for bed. It wasn't the best dream. First of all, I'm used to sleeping next to my wife. Without her, the bed seemed empty, and then my mind just couldn't turn off. I kept going over in my mind what I could have done to prevent this. Should I have tried to get her to stay out the door, physically restraining her, go to that idiot's car with a baseball bat? With a pistol? Was it worth going to jail? It was a long night. I sometimes dozed off and sometimes passed out, but not for long. I finally decided to stand up as light started to come in through the window. I still felt tired, so I decided to take a shower, more to help myself wake up than anything else. After shaving, showering, and brushing my teeth, I put on jeans and a t-shirt and went downstairs. I had breakfast and drank a couple of cups of coffee while reading the newspaper. It was nine in the morning when Kayla returned to the house. I sat in my office at the computer and looked through apartments that were available for rent. 
I had already found lawyers and made an appointment for Monday afternoon using their online scheduling. Good morning, honey. I'm home as promised. She greeted joyfully, entering the house. I just ignored her. Throughout the night and into this morning, I grew increasingly angry at what she did. This morning, as I sipped my coffee, I realized that I had done nothing to deserve such disrespect from her. I also realized that there was nothing I could have done to prevent what she did. It was all on her conscience. If I had somehow managed to stop her date last night, she would have just done it again another time. There are many people who say that you can't suddenly stop loving someone. Perhaps they are right. But what you can do is turn that love into hate. The opposite of love is not hatred, but indifference. With hatred, emotions are still present. Marriage counselors can often save a marriage where there is hatred by turning it back into love. If there is indifference, then there is no chance at all. All the love I felt for my wife yesterday before I returned home has now turned into hatred. It was surprisingly easy to do. All I had to do was focus on the lack of respect she showed me. I then added her threats against me if I did not agree to this. Added to this was her disdain for my feelings. I had a few hours to focus on all this. Cute? Where are you? I'm home, just like I said. I even cleaned myself up before coming to your house. Cute? I heard her call as she walked around the house looking for me. Oh, here you are, she said, opening the door to my office. I'm back, and now everything can go back to normal. She came to my table. She walked around the table and extended her arms to hug and kiss me. I pushed her away. Keep your dirty, sore lips away from me. Only God knows what they touched. Her eyes widened in shock. I've never spoken to her like that in all the years we've known each other. I continued before she could think of an answer. You need to go to the clinic and take a full set of tests for diseases. I want to see a notarized certificate from you before I let you get your dirty paws on me again. As for sex, I wouldn't have it with you for anything in the world. Too much? Maybe. Did I care? No. I watched her expression change from shock to anger. I hoped that she would realize her actions and repent. I see that you are still struggling with your bruised ego. I'm going to go up to our room and take a nap. I've had a long night and I want to get some rest. I hope you calm down and we can talk later. I expect a full apology for your rudeness this morning. With these words, she turned and left the room. I couldn't help but smile, anticipating her soon return. And I didn't have to be disappointed. What the hell did you do? I heard a cry when she returned. Where are your clothes? Where are all your toiletries? What the hell are you doing? She burst into my office. What do you mean? I asked calmly. All my things are exactly where they are supposed to be. What are you talking about? Your closet is empty. Your drawers are empty. Your place on the dressing table is empty. What do you mean when you say everything is where it's supposed to be? As I said, my clothes hang neatly in my closet or are folded and stored in my dresser. My toiletries are neatly in their place in the bathroom. This is wrong. I just told you that your things are not in our bedroom, she exclaimed irritably. Ah, ah, ah. Now I understand your problem. You see, you still mistakenly think your bedroom is our bedroom. I just told you that all my stuff is where it belongs in my bedroom. Do you mean, yes, I told you I wouldn't put up with this, so I moved out of your bedroom. I will live in my new bedroom until I find an apartment and move out. I thought about telling her about our finances, but screw it. Let her figure it out on her own. Besides, there's no point in spoiling the surprise before I've taken care of the investment. Her eyes narrowed in irritation. We'll discuss this later. I'm giving you a week to get over your little seizure, and then I expect you to move everything back and we can get back to normal. Not until I have a notarized certificate that you are free from all diseases, I shot back, returning to the computer. I stayed in my office most of the day. The children returned home early in the morning. I briefly wondered how long it would take for them to realize there was a problem. I found several suitable apartments, filled out forms, and made an appointment for Tuesday to view them. Then I printed out our financial statements. I'll need them for the lawyer on Monday. Although I had no illusions about selling the house, I decided that determining its value might help settle the dispute. In theory, she would owe me half the value of the share. 
wishful thinking, but still. I spent the rest of the day researching the divorce laws in our state. I understood that I would be fucked, but at least I had to imagine how badly. It would help me plan, if nothing else. Daddy, dinner is ready, Carly said, poking her head through the door. Good son. Thank you. Kayla smiled brightly as I walked into the kitchen. It was obvious what her plan was. Kill me with kindness and show me what I would lose if I didn't accept what she did. She gave it her all. She got dressed and put on her makeup. Her hair was styled in a style that I liked. That day she spent a lot of time in the kitchen preparing my favorite dish. When I entered the kitchen, she came up to me and handed me a glass of wine. I poured you a glass of wine, she said, handing it to me and leaning in for a kiss. I saw the pain in her eyes as I pulled away from her. Taking the glass from her, I went to the sink, poured out the wine, and placed the glass on the counter. Then he took a glass out of the cabinet, put a couple of ice cubes in it, and poured a couple of fingers of Jim Beam. There was no way that the children sitting at the table would not notice this. Walking over to the table, I sat down and began chatting with the children. I didn't even pay attention to my wife. The dinner was clearly tense. I kept up the conversation with the children as best I could, but it was very obvious that we had serious problems. It didn't help that I didn't even put anything on my plate, let alone eat anything. These dishes were my favorites, but I just passed the bowls and plates on without even looking at them. I just kept trying to start a conversation with the kids while sipping my drink. Dad, aren't you going to eat something? Josh finally asked. No, not hungry. That was all I answered. After the most awkward dinner in the history of mankind, I simply stood up, filled my glass, and headed back to my office. I didn't even bother to help clear the table. About half an hour later, I turned off the computer, grabbed the keys to my pickup truck, and left the house to go to a nice quiet restaurant for dinner. After that, I went to the bar to have a couple of drinks. When I returned home, it was already quite late. I saw that the light was still on in Kayla's bedroom, so I closed the door to my room and made sure it was noisy enough for her to hear. I locked the bedroom door and then put a chair under the handle. As I was getting ready for bed, I heard her testing the handle and then knocking. She tried to get me to open the door for about five minutes before she gave up. The next morning I got up early. I decided that today would be a football day. There were three games on the program, morning, afternoon, and evening, and I will watch them all. Yes, there were things to do around the house over the weekend, but I decided to ignore them. To hell. I'm not going to live here long so Kayla can just leave it to someone else. I had already drunk most of the coffee and started getting ready to make an omelet for breakfast. I was finishing mine when Carly came into the kitchen. Hello, sunshine, omelet? I asked. Of course, Dad. Thank you. She took her juice and sat down at the table, and I started preparing her food. A few minutes later, Josh appeared. I told him I would cook for him as soon as I finished his sister's food. Carly ate her omelet while I cooked Josh's. I heard Kayla appear in the hallway, so I poured the last of the coffee into my cup and turned off the pot. She shuffled in, took a cup from the cabinet, then looked at the empty coffee pot. You couldn't even leave a cup for me? She looked at me. The coffee pot is over there. You know how to cook it. Doesn't matter. So you're making an omelet? Prepared. Just finished. But feel free to make yourself one, I replied, serving it to Josh's plate. For his plate, I used the last of what I prepared. I even already removed all the ingredients. Fuck her. After taking care of the children, I left the kitchen. It was already past noon. I was sitting in the living room where the morning game was going on. Kayla came in with a plate and a bottle of beer. She placed everything on the coffee table in front of me. I brought you lunch and beer so you don't miss a single game, she said cheerfully. Without looking at her, I raised my foot and swept the plate and bottle off the table onto the floor. She just stood there with her mouth open in shock. Just then they turned on a commercial and I got up, went to the kitchen and got myself a beer. I wasn't going to drink anything she brought me, so it would have been wasted anyway. No, I didn't clean up after myself. She brought it in unnecessarily, so she could clean it herself. I didn't care if it stained the carpet. I didn't intend to live here long anyway. We need to discuss this, Kayla began. Shut up. The game has begun, I replied. 
for God's sake. You need to do something about your attitude. The children have already noticed. They will definitely notice. I'm sure they'll still notice when I move out. Oh, come to your senses. You're not moving out, and there won't be a divorce, she insisted, quickly leaving. It started around noon. At least they were kind enough to wait until the break. Carly and Josh entered the room together. They sat down on the sofa facing me. Dad, what's going on between you and Mom? Carly began. Well, now you can know. Your mother and I are getting a divorce. This has nothing to do with any of you. We both love you. This is just between me and your mother. But why? Josh asked. Because your mother did something that I cannot accept. She did it even after I told her how I felt about it, but she did it anyway. She didn't regret it one bit. You mean, when she went on a date on Friday night? Carly asked. You know about it? I was really surprised. Well, yes. Mom told us you weren't happy about it. So, you know that she cheated on me then? No, I haven't changed it. She said she told you in advance, so it wasn't cheating. She didn't sneak behind your back to do it. And that was the only time she ever did something like that, Josh explained. Yes, Dad. Besides, this was just one night out of the twenty years you had been dating and married. She said if you really loved her, you would just let her have the night and move on with her life, Carly added. To be honest, I was stunned. What also hurt me was that my daddy's girl didn't even bother to understand my position. She sided with her mother and didn't even want to listen to my point of view. Is it true? How about if she really loved me, she wouldn't even think about having sex with anyone else? Come on, Dad. It only happened once, and she promised she would never do it again. Okay, then let's discuss her promises. A little over 17 years ago, she made a solemn vow to me. She made this vow in front of God, our families and friends. She vowed to leave everyone else. There were no exceptions to this oath. The duration of this oath was limited. Until death do us part. In case you haven't noticed, none of us died. If she could so easily break a solemn oath made in public, how can I trust the promises she makes to me in private? Yes, but you also vowed to be with her in good times and bad. Josh was thinking about becoming a lawyer. I hope he does it much better. Right. The problem is that your mother, breaking her oath, broke the contract and released me from the oath. Well, we just don't understand why you would destroy your family over one single night, Carly asked. Why do you say that I am destroying the family? Why am I being accused of what she did? Mom is not going to leave. She wants to put this behind her and move on with her life. You're the one who goes away and makes such a big deal out of everything. If you leave, you will break the family, Carly insisted. After this, the situation did not improve. I tried to explain my position, but they didn't listen. They didn't care about my opinion, not even a little. Kayla had spent the last day filling their heeds with her bullshit. All they knew was that Mom had done something that she really needed to do, and Dad didn't love her, or the kids enough to accept her needs. She convinced them that Daddy's little man's ego had caused him to abandon them all and destroy the family. Dad is to blame for not being able to give Mom one little tiny thing that she really needed for her happiness. Instead, Dad decided to make everyone suffer because of his stubbornness. In fact, it was just one night out of their 20 years of marriage. Seriously, what is one night out of 7,305 nights, which is 20 years with 365 days a year, plus one extra day, in five leap years? They eventually left when it became clear that I was not going to agree with their position. I was able to watch the rest of the game in peace. As the game was ending, I smelled the aromas of dinner being prepared. Obviously, this was another one of my favorite dishes. While waiting for the evening game, I just sat and watched the post-game show. Time was running out. The start of the game was supposed to take place in 20 minutes. Josh came and said dinner was ready. I just stood up, grabbed the keys to my truck, and headed out the door. Where are you going? Is dinner being set on the table yet? Josh asked. I'm going to the sports bar to watch the game. And I'll have something to eat there, I answered. But Mom did. I'll be back after the game. Although I might stick around for a while after finishing. After the game, I actually sat down. They had a very good burger that came with fries. 
The beer was also good. I only drank one beer a quarter of the game, so that was enough for me to get behind the wheel. Plus, it was only five minutes from home. When I got home, everyone had already gone to bed, so I just went to my bedroom, locked and locked the door, and went to bed. The plate and bottle were cleared from the coffee table by the time I got home. This made me smile. On Monday morning, I got up early and left the house before everyone else was up. The first thing I did when I got to the office was call my broker. I explained that I was getting divorced and wanted him to split all of our investments in half. He created a new account in my name only and transferred half of our investment to it. Next is the HR department. I removed Kayla's name from my retirement account and asked them to list Carly and Josh as my heirs. I also provided them with my new bank, account information so they would redirect my salary there. Lastly, I told my boss that I was going through a divorce, so I would need time off for meetings with my lawyer, court dates, meetings, etc. He was okay with it. My lawyer basically told me what I already knew. There was a small chance that I could get custody, but it depended entirely on where the kids wanted to live. They were old enough for the court to take their wishes seriously. Judging by my conversation with them yesterday, I wasn't going to count on it. In fact, the only reason the guy ever hired a lawyer for a divorce was so that the lawyer would smooth out the divorce process. I told him to start the paperwork and asked that she be served at work on Monday. I didn't even bother going home straight after work. It was Monday night football, so I just stopped at a sports bar. Three tacos for a dollar. I ate three in the first half and three more in the second. I ignored text messages and phone calls from Kayla. I answered Carly and told her where I was. Her reaction to this was not very pleasant. All three of them gave me dirty looks when I walked in on them after the game. I just went into my office and closed the door. By the time I finished and went up to my room, everyone had already gone to bed. On Tuesday morning, I got up early and left the house before everyone else was up. Everything was fine with work, and I took the day off to look at apartments. I settled on a nice two-bedroom apartment and paid a deposit. I can move in on Saturday. A trip to the thrift store allowed me to buy a sofa, table, and chairs. They were supposed to be delivered on Saturday afternoon. I decided that I liked the bed I was using and was going to take it as well as everything in my home office. When I returned home, they were already having dinner. I chuckled when I noticed that they didn't even set out a plate for me. This suited me just fine. I wasn't going to eat anyway. I just went to the refrigerator and took out everything I needed to make a huge sandwich. After making a sandwich, I grabbed a bag of chips and a beer and then headed to my office. God, Dad, why are you such an asshole? Carly exclaimed as she entered my office. Well, Carly, to put it simply, your mother cheated on me. She had no respect for me at all. And then she threw it in my face. I'm not going to put up with this. I explained very clearly what would happen if she agreed to this. She did this even though she knew what would happen. You can't seriously destroy your family because of this. Come on, this means nothing. It was just sex. Carly, someday you will get married. Think about how you would feel if your husband told you one evening that he had a date with a younger, more beautiful woman and was going to spend the night with her. Well, I'm sure I wouldn't like it very much. But if he promised to come back to me, and it was just this one time, I'd hope I loved him enough to get through it. Besides, if he told me about it first, it wouldn't look like he was cheating. Yeah, certainly. Do me one favor. When you get married, look your fiancé straight in the eyes when you say your vows. When you look into his loving eyes and come to the phrase about leaving everyone else, imagine how the love in those eyes turns into complete devastation when you tell him that you are leaving to have sex with another man. With these words, I turned my back to her and went back to work. There was an ambush on Wednesday evening. When I returned from work, both sets of parents were there. People often make fun of their father-in-law, but I actually got along very well with her parents. They accepted me into their family as the son they never had. Charles, her father, was a technology geek like me. His only problem was that he liked Fords. Okay, he had extremely poor taste in cars, 
but I could ignore that. He had a 69 Mustang Fastback that was in pristine condition. Yes, I also got along very well with my parents. We weren't one of those dysfunctional families where kids grow up hating their parents. They have always been very loving and supportive of me. Of course, there were disagreements, and they were never shy about telling me when they thought I was wrong about something. Sometimes we just had to agree that we disagreed about something. So, I entered the house and saw that the ambush had already been prepared. I was a little puzzled. I understood why her parents were there. Obviously, they would be on her side. After all, she is their daughter. But what confused me was that my own parents were there. It would seem that this would be counterproductive for her. My parents would agree with me and be on my side. If she was trying to get me to accept her infidelity, why would she invite someone who wasn't on her side and who would argue that I was right to divorce her cheating ass? As you can probably guess, it took me a few more minutes to figure this out. Tom, Charles began his speech. I want you to know that May and I are very disappointed in what Kayla did. But at the same time, we think that you are overreacting to this. Yes, she went and had sex with another man, and it was extremely disrespectful to you, especially the way she did it. However, it was just one mistake. You two have been together for a total of 20 years. You have two wonderful children. Think about it all. Of course, you will be able to survive this little incident. You don't have to destroy your family over a small mistake. A small mistake? Seriously? It was no small mistake. It was not by chance that she tripped. It was a planned event. They probably planned it at least a week in advance. She then ambushes me just an hour before she leaves, giving me no chance to fight her. This was a deliberate plan to deceive me. Son, my mother decided to intervene. She didn't deceive you. She was the first to tell you about it. Eh? What? Of course, you're right. She told me. Told me. She never asked. She just said she would do it and I had no say in the matter. Even when I voiced my serious objections, she didn't care. By the way, I told her what would happen if she did this. Tom, Dad tried. I understand your pain and anger, but think about your family. We love you, son. We will be here to help you heal, but think about what you will do to your family. Kayla still loves you and insists she won't do that again. We all think that with counseling and some effort you can overcome this. Tearing a family apart is not an option. We raised you to be a good person. You need to be a man and save your family. Don't do stupid things that will ultimately damage your relationship with your family. Think about your mother and me. These are our grandchildren, and we will do everything necessary to maintain our relationship with them. I just stood there, completely stunned. My parents were really on her side. They actually told me that I should ignore her cheating. I couldn't stand it anymore. Turning around, I left the room and headed to my bedroom. Kayla tried to follow me, but I closed the door in her face. Within ten minutes, I had changed into jeans, a casual shirt, and boots. I didn't say a word as I walked through the living room and out the front door. They were still sitting there trying to talk to me as I passed by. I didn't even pay attention to them. I just walked out the door, got in my pickup truck, and drove to the sports bar for dinner and a few beers. Luckily, the house was quiet and dark when I returned about four hours later. Thursday and Friday passed in the same spirit. I completely ignored Kayla, and my kids were still mad at me. I was surprised that Kayla had not yet noticed that credit cards no longer worked. I was sure that when she went shopping on Saturday, she would understand this. It was Friday evening. I'd been home for about an hour. I sat in my office, sorting through things and deciding what exactly I would take tomorrow and what later. Kayla opened the door and walked in. She was wearing a sheer nightgown, stockings, a garter belt, and heels. I must say she looked fantastic. Today the children are spending the night in a different place. It's time for you to forget about this nonsense and go to bed with me. I want you to make love to me all night long. I really need you to take me back. I looked at her for a minute. No thanks. In addition, I have not yet seen a certificate from the clinic confirming that you do not have any diseases. Stop being funny. I need you in my bed. Your hysteria will achieve nothing. Now come on. 
I need sex. Not the slightest interest. Look, if you don't do this, I'll have to call Clarence again. Here's a one-time offer for you. Damn it, it was a one-time thing, but if you're going to keep rejecting me, then you're the one pushing me back to someone else. Have fun. Let me know if you bring him here so I can leave. The smoke coming out of her ears and nose as she ran out of the room took a few minutes to clear. About half an hour later, I heard the front door slam. She practically burned her tires as she sped down the street. Taking advantage of the fact that the house was empty, I collected a few things. I took the bed apart and loaded it into the pickup, along with most of my clothes. Today I will sleep on the sofa in my office. After loading everything I wanted to take with me into the pickup, I drank a gym beam with ice and relaxed. The couch wasn't the most comfortable I've slept on, but that was okay. Early the next morning, I was at the rental office and received the key to the apartment. It took me a little time, but I managed to take everything out of the pickup truck and into the apartment. Luckily, a couple of friendly neighbors helped me out. When I returned, no one was home yet. So the neighbor's teenage son helped me load the desk and office furniture. The computer, printer, and accessories went into the cabin. I looked around the living room and thought, to hell with everything. I'll take the chair, too. I'm guessing that either no one returned home until the evening, or no one bothered to look into my office or spare bedroom. It's surprising that they didn't notice the chair was missing. It was early evening when my phone rang. Seeing that it was my daughter, I answered, Dad, where are you? I'm home, honey. No, not at home. Your office is cleaned, the bed and dresser in the spare bedroom are gone, and your chair is missing from the living room. Besides, I looked everywhere and you weren't here. Plus, your pickup is missing. You're right. I'm not there. I'm home. I don't live there anymore. For now, I have moved into an apartment. Maybe after the divorce, I will buy myself another house. But for now, this will suffice. God, Dad. I can't believe you're being such an idiot. I thought you loved us. I love you, sweet. I have always loved and will always love but not so much as not to leave us. I'm not leaving you. You will still be able to see me as much as you want. I will still take care of you and your brother. You're leaving us. You abandoned us and are destroying the family. It was your mother who destroyed the family. I told her what would happen if she went on this date, but she did it anyway. But she thought you loved her enough to get through it. And I thought she loved me enough not to do that. Amazing. Doesn't matter. Then she hung up. Yes, the divorce was a nightmare. She fought it to the end. Consultations. She wanted me to pay. I refused. I argued that if she needed it, then she should pay for it. This was one of the few arguments I won. What a waste of time. The consultant didn't really like me. I think it had to do with the fact that I told her that I was ordered to attend class, but the judge didn't say anything about me actually having to participate. I endured all 12 sessions before the consultant finally gave up. She fought about literally everything. That worthless funny poster in the garage that she absolutely despised. Suddenly she simply couldn't live without him. The Bud Light I accidentally left in the office. She hated it. But it had been on my desk since college. It became the centerpiece around which she would remodel the office. Yes, it was complete nonsense. She only did this to make the divorce as difficult as possible for me. All this time, she made sure that I saw the children as little as possible. Finally, the judge granted the request for divorce. I had to continue paying half of the mortgage. The house, of course, remained with her. Child support was $2,000 a month, but I was able to visit the children every Wednesday night and every weekend. What really pissed me off was the $1,000 a month for five years of spousal support. It would be annulled if she remarried during that time. I wasn't going to hold my breath. I learned that she moved Clarence in with her before the divorce was finalized. So yes, half of my salary went to her. I cashed out some of my investments and bought a small house that was in dire need of renovation. At least I got it cheap. This is even on a one four acre lot. Luckily, I was able to move all my tools out of the garage a week after I moved out. I refused to even discuss them. I had most of them before we met. When she pressed, I started talking about all her jewelry, expensive clothes and shoes. The house had electricity, gas, and running water. There was a roof, 
but the walls stood. That was enough for me. I moved into a house and started working on it in the evenings and weekends. Visits. Yes, I was entitled to visits. I actually visited several times. It was a fucking disaster. Kayla did everything she could to stop me. The children were busy. They went for the weekend with friends. Funny how it was always on my weekend, not hers. Oh, Kayla has dance practice on Wednesday. Josh has an important test on Thursday and needs to study. The few times I was able to visit the children on Wednesday evenings, they were hostile towards me. They still blamed me for everything, even if I explained my point of view to them. When the opposition literally keeps them captive all the time, and I only occasionally have an hour or two, it's a losing battle. After the third time, they directly told me that they did not want to see me anymore. Yes, I could force them. But what's the point? Forcing them to see me would only cause more resentment. I sent them gifts, cards, and letters on their birthdays and Christmas. All of them were returned unopened. I continued to send my monthly checks. I saw them being cashed, but never heard a word. High school graduation? I guess they graduated from high school, but I haven't heard anything about it. I sent a certified letter informing them of the college funds I had arranged for them. In response, I heard, no, thank you. Kayla basically turned my children against me, just like she promised. I focused on work, home, and only that. I didn't go out or do anything. It's amazing how much money you can save by doing this, as if all this wasn't enough. Hi, Mom, I said when she answered the phone. Volume? How are you doing? She answered cheerfully. As good as could be expected. Anyway, I haven't heard anything about Thanksgiving. Are you hosting it again this year? There was silence on the other end. Mother? Are you still there? I asked. Oh. Ooh, mmm. Well? It's a little awkward. Ooh, mmm. Yes, we are going. But Kayla, her parents, and children will come to the party. She will also bring a new man into her life. We just felt that having you here would be too awkward for everyone. After all, the kids are still mad at you for abandoning them, and you being with Kayla and her new man will just make everyone too tense. Seriously, Mom? You give up your own son for Thanksgiving and invite my ex-wife and her boyfriend instead? Well, we want to maintain a close relationship with our grandchildren. Besides, it's your fault. You should have worked to keep your family together, not tear it apart. How about coming to our place on Christmas Eve? Your father and I will spend Christmas Day at Kayla's house, but we can celebrate it with you the day before. It doesn't matter, I muttered, ending the conversation. I spent Christmas Eve at home watching Die Hard and ignoring numerous calls and text messages from my mom asking where I was. I wasn't in a festive mood. I was just looking at the packages I sent to my kids a week ago. Yesterday, they were returned to my doorstep. True, five years later, I received a message about the wedding. Kayla married Clarence the weekend after I paid my last maintenance payment. Bitch. Josh had turned 18 the year before, so I was done with child support. Now I was. Completely free from my former family and obligations to them. I celebrated the occasion by getting drunk. Yeah, I'm not very proud of it, but screw it. I worked my ass off and gave them all the love I could, only to be rejected and treated like crap. To hell with them. Now that all my obligations to this bitch and her two ungrateful offspring were fulfilled, I decided to just put them out of my mind as much as possible. They clearly didn't want any relationship with me, so I just forgot about them as much as possible and moved on with my life. Well, except for one thing that has always bothered me. I had to continue paying half the mortgage on the house. Of course, that ended when Josh graduated, but my name was still on the contract. I think Kayla was under the mistaken impression that the house was hers. The divorce stated that she could only live there until the children finished school. Now all bets were off. I was entitled to half the property, and it was quite a large property. I contacted my lawyer. To begin with, when we got divorced, the house was appraised at about $300,000 with equity in the house of about $200,000. This was five years ago. Since then, we have been paying our mortgage regularly, and property values in our area have increased significantly. After doing a little research on Lina, I estimate that the appraised value is now around 
500 Ekizit, and the net worth is $450,000. Yes, we only had $50,000 left on the bill. Why did I do this? Well, of course, because of the money. Who couldn't use an extra quarter of a million dollars? There was also the fact that this would make Kayla very angry. She adored this house, and having to give me a penny for anything would make her furious, and I wanted any kind of payback for what she had done. It would also reimburse me for all the house maintenance costs and mortgage payments I had to make for her. The call came about a week later. Volume. What the hell's going on? Well, Kayla, there's not much going on here. Just working and renovating the house I bought. What's happening to you? I must admit that I was surprised that you called to see how I was doing. After all, this is the first time you've talked to me since the divorce. You're an asshole. I'm not calling to find out how you're doing. I'm calling to find out why a realtor just came to my house to inspect it and get my signature on the sales contract. Oh, this. Well, this should be pretty clear. Since both of our names are on the title, she will obviously need your signature for the sale. What sales? I love this house and I have no plans to sell it. Then when can I expect a check from you for my half share? Nice try. I got the house in a divorce. No. You only used the house until Josh graduated from school. This happened last month. Now we can either sell it and split the proceeds, or you buy my half. If you think I'm going to give you $100,000 for a house that is rightfully mine, then you're crazy. Well, that proves I'm not crazy. I'm not asking for $100,000. You could have done this five years ago. Now, since the home's equity is about $450,000, my half is $225,000. Considering all the expensive furniture you simply must have, let's round that up to $250,000. You're crazy. I won't give you a cent, she shouted, hanging up. Yes, I laughed after she hung up. Yes, my lawyer got her cut, but it was worth it to see her face a couple of months later when the judge ruled in my favor. I even managed to convince the judge to make her pay the legal fees, as well as my lawyer, for taking her to court for something that should have been settled out of court. The house was valued at more than I expected. Taking into account the cost of furniture, I received $275,000. In the end, they bought me instead of selling me. I later found out that they were mainly using Clarence's money. This ended up biting him in the ass, but more on that later. I managed to get the house in order. I even built a decent-sized workshop behind the house. I picked up an old 1972 Chevrolet pickup that was in poor condition. I was only interested in the chassis. The rest would have been replaced anyway. Over the last year, I have taken it apart, cleaned it, and completely repainted it. Once the paint and bodywork was done, it was time to work on the chassis. The rear differential was still good, but I still rebuilt it. It had to withstand the power that I was going to put through it. Transmission is a four-speed manual Borg Warner T10. It was a quick thing. I decided to have some fun with the engine. It will be just a toy, not for everyday driving. 427 Big Block Engine. I managed to find it on the internet at a spare parts warehouse. I bought it and ordered delivery. Once it arrived, I placed it on the stand and began taking it apart. I had to send it to a machine shop to have the cylinders, connecting rod and cam board, new forged crankshaft, pistons, 10-1, great heavy cam. I moved and polished the heads, then installed the dual spring valves. And then, a supercharger to bring everything to mind. Yes, I would probably drive through more gas stations than tire shops. And yes, I would end up driving through very few gas stations. I chromed the valve covers, polished the aluminum on the supercharger, and used steel braided hoses. Opening the hood almost required sunglasses. The first time I went out on the road, I almost crashed into it. I was driving on the highway and decided to give the gas. Big mistake. The rear tires instantly fell off. I barely managed to stay in a straight line before I could let off the gas. Remember, press the gas pedal slowly. After that, I started driving a little more carefully. A few weeks later, I saw an ad for a car show open to the public. Thinking it would be fun, I filled out the form and paid the entry fee. When the day arrived, I loaded up the 72 Chevy and drove to the park. I checked in and got my seat. As I was setting up the car, 
I noticed a very nice 1968 GTO parked next to me. I installed my shade structure in the area behind the truck. A couple of chairs and a refrigerator completed my setup. That's when I noticed some attractive redheads setting up chairs behind the GTO. Yes, I said redheads, plural. There were two of them. One looked about my age, and the other was in her mid to late teens. Perhaps still a schoolgirl. There were two very important points that I did not see. I didn't see the guy with them, and I didn't see anything on the older woman's left ring finger. Of course I looked. Good morning. I like your car, I said cheerfully. They both looked up from what they were doing. Hello, thank you. I like your pickup truck too, said the older one. Thank you. Have you been to many of them? This is my first. That is, I have been to car shows before, but only as a spectator. This is the first one I'm participating in. By the way, my name is Tom. Well, my daughter and I are participating in them for the third time. My ex has already taken part in them several times. I'm Marie, and this is my daughter, Jenny. In that case, when you're done, why don't you two join me in the shadows? I have a cooler full of drinks, and I could use any information I can get about these shows. We ended up sitting almost all day. From time to time, we got up and talked to someone about our cars. But the day passed very pleasantly. No, I didn't win any awards, but I still had fun. I found out that she divorced her husband three years ago because she caught him cheating. He cheated with his boss's wife. She made a deal with him. She would give him all the videos if he would transfer GTO to her. She told me that it would really hurt him and she wanted him to keep his job so he could continue to pay her child support and maintenance. For her, it was a double win. Besides, his boss was an asshole and she didn't care that his wife was cuckolding him. Jenny was also friendly and joined in the conversation. She told me that she was very angry with her father for his infidelity. She doesn't want anything to do with him anymore. We were having such a good time that I didn't want it to end. When the show was over, I suggested they go to Red Lobster for dinner a couple blocks away. They agreed, and we went there. I didn't really want to be sad, but they asked, and I told them my story. I have listed the main points. I told them that my children had sided with my wife and had nothing to do with me anymore. Are you saying that she cheated and your children blame you for divorcing her? Jenny was amazed. Yes. I tried to explain everything to them, but by that time, she had already turned them against me. Marie put her hand on my shoulder. I'm so sorry for you, Tom. You seem like such a nice guy, but you don't deserve anything like this, she said sincerely. I decided to change the topic to something more pleasant. We ended up talking and laughing for another hour. It seemed like there was a real connection between us. We exchanged numbers, and Marie agreed to meet me again. As they walked away, I saw Jenny give me a big smile, wink, and give me two thumbs up. I realized that she also did not mind me meeting her mother again. So Marie and I met again. It was the next weekend. I called and asked. She agreed enthusiastically. Dinner and dancing. I received a kiss on the cheek as I walked her to the door. As I turned to leave, I saw a red-haired teenage girl in the window, smiling and giving me two thumbs up. After two more dates, I invited them both to my house and cooked them dinner. After my divorce, I learned to cook quite well. A chain of restaurants, a few YouTube videos, a lot of trial and error. I make very tasty lasagna, so I settled on that. They seemed to like it. They really liked my house. But I overheard Marie telling her daughter that it definitely needed a woman's touch. I wouldn't argue if asked. The following weekend I was invited to their home. Marie cooked in a way that put my feeble attempts to shame. Even Kayla wasn't as good as Marie. I couldn't help it. I know it's fucking rude but I just couldn't stop eating. In the end, I had to apologize to them for making myself look like a pig. They just laughed and asked why I was apologizing. That was the biggest compliment you could give to a woman who loves to cook. She told me that Jenny was almost as good as her. This happened two weekends later. I invited Marie to dinner and then to a dance club. We had been dancing for some time when a slow song started playing. We clung to each other, swaying to the beat of the music.
A few weeks ago, we had already moved on to some pretty heated kissing. She leaned over and whispered in my ear, Take me home. To be honest, I was surprised. I thought we were having a great time, but now she wanted to go home. I pulled back to look at her. She must have seen the look on my face and started giggling. Oh, you stupid man. I meant take me to your house. Oh, well then. Luckily, I had a regular pickup and not a 72. I'm not sure I would have been able to keep the tires on the road if I had driven the 72 home. We made love. We ended up doing this three times before we fell asleep. I made her breakfast before taking her home. I received another double thumbs up from the red-haired teenager in the window. A few months later, I asked, and she responded. It was a simple ceremony in the presence of a judge. They moved into my house right after the wedding. Jenny even started calling me daddy. Life was wonderful. Yes, there were disagreements. Yes, Jenny and I had our differences too. She was still a teenager, and I was an authority figure. Sometimes I had to say no. Still, she respected me, and her mother loved me as much as I loved her. An unexpected call came about a year later. It was a number I didn't recognize. Hello, I said, picking up the phone. Hi, Daddy, said an excited female voice on the other end of the line. Carly? Yes, Daddy. It's me and I have great news. Is it true? I'm very pleased to hear from you. It was really nice to hear her. Maybe she wanted to improve the relationship. I'm getting married. That's great, honey. I'm so happy for you. Basically, I want you to be at my wedding. Oh, honey. Certainly. For a father, it is one of the greatest honors to walk his daughter down the aisle. And I also organized a wedding fund for you. Oh, no. Clarence is paying for the wedding and he will walk me down the aisle. Also, since it would be very awkward for you and your mother to sit together, you will not sit in the first pew. But I really want you to be there. Clarence, is this the one your mother cheated on me with? Did she really marry this piece of shit? Listen, Dad, I'm trying to rebuild my relationship and I wanted to reach out and invite you to my wedding. Besides, after you left, she and Clarence started seeing each other more often, fell in love, and got married. In fact, it's your fault. If you hadn't left us, she and Clarence would never have continued dating. Fine. I see that you are still under the impression that your mother did nothing wrong. So, I won't be able to attend for two reasons. First of all, I simply cannot support a marriage that I know will fail. Most likely you will cheat on your husband, like your mother cheated on me. If he's anything I'd approve of, he'll kick your slutty ass to the curb as soon as he finds out. Secondly, you just stole my father's last great honor and gave it to this scumbag who deliberately seduced a married woman. This once again shows what a shallow, eccentric bitch you have become. Okay, if you continue to be like this, then don't expect to ever see your grandchildren. If you raise them to be like you, I still don't want anything to do with them. Really, Dad? Mom is right. You really are an asshole. And that was the last thing I heard from my daughter when I hung up. Well, here are the chances of a relationship with my ex-daughter. I'm almost sure there won't be a relationship with Josh either. Yes, it was painful. They still blamed me for what their mother did. I put down the phone and went to the workshop. Instead of wallowing in sadness, I'd get to work on the 1963 Chevrolet pickup I pulled out of the field a couple of months ago. It wasn't supposed to be as radical as my 72. I wanted to be able to ride it more. I rebuilt a 350 engine that was only slightly more powerful than stock. And I didn't even notice how Jenny sneaked around the corner and took my phone. I didn't even know she was home. I was so angry at my father. I tried to reach him, but he has the audacity to talk to me like that? It is his fault that our family fell apart. I tried to be nice and invite him to my wedding and he just threw everything in my face. I hoped that he would finally take responsibility for what he did to our family. Looking down, I saw that my phone was ringing. I didn't recognize the number, but there were a lot of calls like this when planning a wedding. Hello? Mmm, hi. Is this Carly Williams? Yes. Can I help you? Yes, you can. You can stop calling my dad and being a bitch to him. He's the best person I've ever known, and he doesn't deserve someone as stupid and spoiled as you calling him to remind him 
that you're a pathetic excuse for humanity. I swear you and your family are a waste of air to breathe. Who the hell are you? My name is Jenny Williams. I'm your sister. My mother married your ex-father and he adopted me. I love him with all my heart, and it would never even occur to me to disrespect him or disgrace him in the slightest. You are an insult to the daughters of the whole world. I know everything about what happened. Your mother went on a date, with absolutely no respect for her husband, and had sex with another guy. The saddest thing about all of this is that you don't seem to mind. Let me tell you, my biological father cheated on my mom. She threw him to the curb without hesitation. You can be sure that if my mom ever cheated on my dad, I would help my dad take her ass out with the rest of the trash. Yes, even though he is not my biological father, he is the most decent, caring, compassionate person I have ever met. I'm thinking of sending your mother a card thanking her for being such a big fool for letting him go. If it weren't for her extreme stupidity, he wouldn't be my father now. Oh, and you can also tell your grandparents that they have another granddaughter. But I have no desire to maintain any relationship with anyone so vile as to reject his own son for a cheater and her treacherous offspring. There is one more thing you can do for me. When you say your joke vows, look into your husband's eyes and think about when he decides to cheat on you. When he actually cheats on you, call me and tell me about it so I can laugh at you. You have a shitty life, sis, she said after hanging up. I stared at the phone in shock. First of all, I was surprised to hear that my father got married. You'd think he'd at least send his kids an invitation. Secondly, I found out that I now also have a younger sister. A strange thought came into my head. I couldn't help but think that she was a lot like me before Mom told Josh and me about Dad leaving and going to destroy the family over one small thing. At first I thought that Dad must have had a very good reason for this and decided that maybe I could live with him instead of Mom. But then Mom explained how she felt and that she just needed this little thing to rejuvenate herself. After all, it was just one short period of time compared to how long they had been together. Besides, Mom was willing to stay together and work things out. It was Dad who acted like a pig and refused to even try. It was Dad who left. He was the one who separated them. I couldn't believe how rudely she treated me. She didn't even give me a chance to tell her that it was Dad who abandoned use and Mom who was trying to move forward. It was as if she didn't even care that it was just a one-time thing that shouldn't have even crossed the radar considering how long they'd been together and she has the nerve to call me all these vilely names, she doesn't even know me. And why was the father so upset? Of course, Clarence was going to walk me down the aisle. After all, he has been by my side for the past few years. I haven't even talked to my dad since Josh and I told him how angry we were about him leaving. Additionally, Clarence paid almost $20,000 for my wedding. I couldn't even imagine how much the pennies my father could save for my wedding would be enough. Half an hour later, when my mother and both grandmothers arrived, I was still upset about these phone calls. They went shopping. Mom immediately noticed my mood. Honey, what happened? I told my dad about the wedding and asked him to come. After all, I am his only daughter and I thought he would want to be at my wedding, hoping that maybe this would be something we could build on and maybe start a relationship again. Oh, that's great, Grandma Williams exclaimed. Will he be there? We haven't heard from him since he called about Thanksgiving a few years ago. I sighed. No. He got angry when I told him that Clarence would walk me down the aisle, and I thought it would be too awkward for him to sit in the front pew with Mom and Clarence. Oh, this is very bad. I thought that he had already overcome his piggish stubbornness. Well, if that wasn't bad enough, five minutes later I found out that I have a half-sister. What? It sounded in two-voice harmony. Yes. The girl who said her name was Jenny Williams called me a few minutes after Dad hung up. Apparently, Dad married her mom and adopted her. She wasn't very helpful on the phone. Actually, the nicest thing she said was that she wanted to thank my mom for being stupid. Otherwise, she wouldn't have such a great dad. I recounted both telephone conversations to them. They were shocked by the harshness coming from Dad and Jenny. Tom got married, but we weren't invited to the wedding. He didn't even tell us about it. Do I have another granddaughter? Grandma Williams whispered to herself. 
Finally, my wedding day arrived. I thought briefly about what my father said and was momentarily sad that he wouldn't be there on my special day. Well, I turned to him, and he rejected me. I shrugged it off. It was a happy day after all. I married a man I truly loved, for the person with whom I will spend the rest of my life. Clarence beamed with happiness as he took my hand and we began to walk down the aisle to the music of the wedding march. I was overjoyed looking at all my friends and relatives. Both my grandparents were there. Josh was one of Bobby's best men. Everyone was here to celebrate my special day. Tears of joy appeared in my eyes. I looked forward and saw my Bobby smiling at me, standing in front of the priest. As we walked past my mother, I saw her beaming with pride. Tears of joy also flowed down her cheeks. Clarence lifted my veil, kissed me on the cheek and said, Congratulations, baby. He then handed me over to my future husband. When the priest asked, Who gives the bride away? Clarence replied, Her mother and I. Something sounded wrong, but at that moment I couldn't figure out what. This soon passed as the priest began the ceremony. I looked into the eyes of the love of my life. I said my vows, to have and keep, in sickness and in health, in good times and bad, leaving, leaving, I couldn't say it. I looked straight into Bobby's eyes and just couldn't say it. I suddenly remembered what that bitch said on the phone. I looked into the eyes of my betrothed and suddenly saw him with another woman. The picture suddenly changed. Now I was looking into the dull eyes of a broken man, telling him that I had sex with another man. These pictures flashed through my mind. The words came out without thought. I understand now. If before it seemed to me that we were under the close attention of the public, now it was nothing compared to what it was now. Bobby looked at me with concern. Suddenly it was as if a weight had fallen on me. The biggest smile of my entire life appeared on my face. Finally, I understand. I told Bobby. Mmm. This is very cool, Carly, but what did you suddenly understand? Everything, I answered. Then I got serious. Bobby, do you really love me? Of course I love you. How can you even ask this? I have to ask this because I can't marry you today. I swear I felt a rush of air rush past me as the entire audience gasped in shock. We will still get married but not today. This is wrong, and I have to make it right. I'm only getting married once, and it's for life, so I have to do it right. Baby, what happened? Bobby, I love you with everything I have. I'm going to marry you. I'll explain everything to you, and you'll understand, but we need to go and start fixing everything. We will postpone everything to another day and play our wedding. You won't leave me at the altar, will you? Not a chance. In fact, you should come with me. With these words, I turned to the guests. I truly regret this, but I just can't go through with it today. We are not canceling our wedding. We are just postponing it. We will let you all know when we set a new date. We understand if you decide not to come, but just think about what story about today will stay with you for years to come. Don't you want to come next time and see what happens next? In any case, in order to somehow compensate for your disappointment, the reception hall must be ready. Everything is already paid for with non-refundable deposits, so why not take advantage of it? The bar is open, so eat, drink, dance, and be merry. Don't worry, Clarence will pay the bill. With that, I took Bobby's hand and walked back down the aisle. Suddenly my exit was blocked by my mother, and Clarence was standing next to her. He didn't seem happy that I had just flushed over $20,000 down the toilet. I also noticed that all the guests were now focused on this new confrontation. Those who stood up to leave for the reception stopped to watch the next show. Clarence started shouting some nonsense about the money he spent and how I was going to pay him every cent back for this stunt I just pulled. Then it's mom's turn. Carly, what are you doing? Where are you going? She asked. What I'm doing is correcting a mistake that I made several years ago. What mistake? The biggest mistake of my life. The mistake I made was listening to all the bullshit you spouted instead of helping daddy kick your slutty ass to the curb. The mistake I made when I blamed my dad for destroying the family while it was all your fault by cheating on him. Carly, I'm your mother, and you will speak to me with respect. Really, Mom? 
Once a cheater, it means always a cheater. Carly, how dare you? How dare I? I'm really ashamed that I looked up to you. It wasn't until I looked into Bobby's eyes as I said my vow that I woke up and realized what a terrible person you truly are. Once a deceiver, he always remains a deceiver. Looking into his eyes, I suddenly realized how terrible it would be if he ever cheated on me. I realized how much I would hurt the person I love if I ever cheated on him. I think my dad was still a good role model for me, but you definitely weren't. What? What? What do you mean? Mom asked. I noticed a little fear in her eyes. Seriously, Mom, you think I don't know about your Wednesday afternoon workouts with Jim Davis, your personal trainer? Why do they always take place at his apartment and not at the gym? It's funny how you only go to the gym to see Jim. How about the fact that Carlos, your pool cleaner, needs an extra hour every two weeks because you have sex after cleaning the pool? I have some good footage from when I came home early a couple of times, in case you try to deny it. And let's not forget how you always tip Mario, your hairstylist, in the back room after every visit to the hair salon. At least Clarence is your boss at work and he doesn't have to worry about you cheating on him with your boss. Have I forgotten anyone? Oh yeah, I almost forgot about Alan Morris, your neighbor. For the last three years he'd come whenever his wife had a bachelorette party. Her eyes flickered to Clarence as I finished airing her dirty laundry. Perhaps she was hoping that he miraculously didn't hear anything, even though I said it loud enough to be heard throughout the entire church, and he was standing less than two feet away from me. Clarence had a look of utter shock on his face. The moment I looked at Clarence, an evil thought came into my head. Oh, and Clarence, before God and all these witnesses, I swear with the same commitment that my mother made when she made her wedding vows, that I will pay you back the money you spent on this wedding. We all know how she keeps her vows, so you can fully count on me to keep that vow just as she kept hers. Yes, he shouldn't hold his breath waiting for even ten cents. Seeing that Mom was distracted, I pulled Bobby down the aisle. I made a short stop to talk to the videographer. Yes, he caught everything on camera. He smiled broadly as he handed me a copy of the videotape. He was determined to make a duplicate in case something happened to the original. I quickly signed the permission form to post the video on YouTube. I was hoping it would go viral and add to my mom's shame. Bobby and I ran out to the parking lot. He came here in his car and our bags were in the trunk. We planned to transfer them to the limo before leaving the reception. His brother was going to take her to his place after the reception. I smiled, knowing that Daddy would really like Bobby and slid into the passenger seat. I was instantly horny when he turned on the ignition and the huge twin-carb Ford 40 engine rumbled to life. Sure, it wasn't GM, but the 1969 Challenger was still a beast. Where are we going? He asked as we roared out of the parking lot. We're going west on 156th. I'll find the address and put it into Waze, I replied, working on the phone. It wasn't difficult, after all, he didn't try to hide. I knew the city he lived in, and a search of the property records gave me the answers I needed. He was about two hours away. We could only hope that he would be home when we got there. We didn't stop to change clothes. I was on a mission and didn't want to waste time. It's not a common occurrence when you open your front door and see a woman in a wedding dress and a man in a tuxedo standing on the porch of your home. I mean, if you are a minister of a church and live in a church, then this probably happens sometimes. The problem was that I was not a priest and certainly did not live at the church. What was even more amazing was that I actually knew which one was which. I had no idea who this man was, but it was definitely my eldest daughter standing there. My eldest daughter, who has made it clear that she doesn't want to see me anymore. I remembered that today was her wedding day, but I couldn't understand why she was here. She must be either at church, at a reception, or on her way to her honeymoon. Standing on my doorstep was the very last place she should have been. Daddy, can I talk to you for a minute, please? She asked very quietly. Still stunned, I stepped back and allowed them to enter. I gestured towards the living room where Marie and Jenny were sitting. I also noticed the shocked expression on their faces. Um, Carly... This is my wife, Marie, and our daughter, Jenny. Jenny Marie, this is Carly. Sorry, but I don't know who the guy is with her. 
Oh, yeah. Dad, this is my fiancé, Bobby Jensen. Bobby, this is my dad, Tom Williams, his wife Marie, and my sister Jenny, Carly introduced. Groom, I thought he was supposed to be your husband by now. Didn't you get married a couple of hours ago? I was confused. This is what I need to talk to you about. I couldn't do it today. I can't get married until my dad walks me down the aisle. Daddy, I finally understand. You are right. You were always right. I'm sorry for getting caught up in my mom's shit and blaming you. It was mom who abandoned everything, not you who abandoned us. Forgive me for everything I said and did. You didn't deserve any of this. I won't make excuses for my behavior, because there really are no excuses except that I was young, stupid, and listened to the wrong people. I just hope that you can find it in your heart to forgive me and allow me back into your life. I really, really want to marry Bobby. He's a really great guy, and I know you'll like him. I just can't marry him unless you agree to walk me down the aisle and marry me off. Well, this was completely unexpected. I probably should have focused on other things, but there seemed to be one or two elephants in the room. Even though I was very happy that my daughter decided that I wasn't the bastard who abandoned them and wanted me back in her life, my curiosity about the scene in front of me required some attention. So, um, Carly. Oom. Um, did something happen at the wedding? I mean, you're wearing a wedding dress and Bobby's in a tuxedo. So I'm guessing you actually attended the wedding. She looked at herself, then at her fiancé. Oh, yeah. In fact, we were already halfway through the ceremony when I had an epiphany. Here, she said, handing me the disc. Maybe you should watch it while Bobby and I change into regular clothes. Bobby ran to the car and grabbed his suitcase while Marie walked Carly to the bedroom where they could change. While this was happening, I set up a video player connected to the big screen in the living room. Once Carly and Bobby were busy, Marie came back and sat next to me and I pressed the play button on the remote. It all started as a normal wedding ceremony. The groomsmen walked the bridesmaids down the aisle and then separated at the altar. Bobby came in with the priest, ring bearer, then flower girl. Finally, Clarence walked Carly down the aisle. Everything was pretty typical until Carly started saying her vows. Even this was normal to some extent. Suddenly, she seemed to have trouble speaking. She seemed stuck on one word. She made it. I can't believe she actually did it and that it really hurt her that much, Jenny whispered to herself. I was about to ask her what she was talking about when Carly stopped saying the vow and changed everything. We watched the video of her stopping the wedding and then confronting her mom. I was shocked by her revelations. Apparently, her infidelities became more frequent after she married Clarence. By the time the video ended, Carly and Bobby had changed their clothes and returned to the living room. I just couldn't get through it. I looked into Bobby's eyes and knew how much it would hurt him if I did to him the same way mom did to you. I finally understood what it really means leave everyone else, and that my mother broke this oath. Then I realized how much she had dishonored you, and that I had dishonored you by marrying, without giving you the place of honor that you deserved. How can I make such solemn vows in a ceremony where two of the most dishonorable men I know take pride of place? How can these vows have any real meaning if they don't involve the noblest man I know? I realized that if I truly wanted these vows to have meaning, then it would be my dad, the man who truly taught me values and integrity, who would walk me down the aisle. I decided that when I married Bobby, it should be you, not Mom and Clarence. Carly was silent for a minute, then smiled and looked at Jenny. Besides, I need my little sister to be one of my bridesmaids. It was your kick in the ass that woke me up. I remembered what you said to me when I looked into Bobby's eyes trying to say the vow, how can I get married if you don't stand by my side? This was very important. We talked for several more hours. I didn't know that Jenny got Carly's phone number from my phone right after I left for my studio after calling Carly that day. She went to her room, and a few minutes later she called Carly from her phone. It was getting late, so I asked them to stay in the guest bedroom for the night. Carly received several more calls throughout the evening. She ignored calls from Clarence and Kayla, but several of her friends also called her. It seems that some of the guests accepted her offer to have fun at Clarence's expense. He tried to cancel the appointment, but it was too late to get the money back. 
By the time he got to the reception venue, there were already several dozen people taking advantage of the open bar. The food was also already being prepared, and all the waiters, bartenders, and DJ were already in place and working. Clarence finally gave in, grabbed a drink, and moved to a table in the corner to drown his sorrows. Josh sent her a video he took on his phone when his mom came over to talk to Clarence. Looks like things didn't go very well. Clarence shouted a lot. Insulting words took up most of the conversation. It looks like this relationship will soon end. Josh said he was able to cancel his plane and resort reservations, but was charged a 20% penalty for late cancellations. Since Carly and Bobby had already taken time off from work to go on their honeymoon, they stayed with us for the entire week. I reconnected with the daughter I thought I had lost. I also met Bobby. He's a great guy with strong moral values. The relationship was a little strained at first because the only things he had heard about me were the lies my ex-wife, son, and daughter told him. Well, not exactly a lie, but rather an embellishment of the truth that painted me as a bad guy who abandoned his family. There were also several important facts that were left out of these conversations. After the truth began to emerge, he began to warm up to me. This helped when I showed him my workshop and my latest projects. Although he preferred classic Dodges, we both appreciated each other's cars. Hey, we're both tech geeks. At least he wasn't one of those weaklings who drives an automatic. His Challenger had a manual transmission. Around midweek, a new wedding date was set. It was supposed to take place in the same place on the same weekend a year later. This time, I will pay for her and walk her down the aisle. In addition, Marie was called upon to help with the wedding. Yes, Jenny was going to be a bridesmaid too. Carly and Bobby called everyone in the wedding party and gave them the latest news. Well, everyone except Kayla and Clarence. Over the next few months, Carly and I worked hard to repair our relationship. Bobby and I also got to know each other better. We attended several car shows, driving Marie's GTO, my 72 pickup, Bobby's Challenger, and even got Jenny to enter the 74 Firebird I bought for her. Carly and Bobby would come and spend a couple of days with us a couple times a month. Even Josh showed up a few times. It was more difficult with him because he was always closer to his mother than to me, but we restored part of our relationship. I think he did it more for Carly than for me, but I'll accept it. Besides, he always had some news from home. By the way, things weren't going well for Kayla and Clarence. Clarence moved out and filed for divorce. The good news for Kayla was that Clarence filed not because of adultery, but because of irreconcilable differences. This meant that the harsh penalties provided for in the marriage contract would not apply. He applied in such a way as to get it over with quickly and without a fight. The good news for Clarence was that he had a prenuptial agreement. The marriage contract stated that all property that he owned before marriage was not subject to division. Kayla would receive half of the property acquired during the marriage, but this would not be enough when taking into account the property acquired before the marriage. Basically, she will keep the house and receive about $50,000. As for the house, Clarence did try to get a piece of it, but he had no proof that he was entitled to it. Of course, it was with his money that my share was purchased after the divorce, but there was no real evidence of this. He apparently took out a business loan for his company to get the money, but never documented exactly what he spent it on. In addition, they never put his name on the title deed for the house. Since the house belonged to Kayla before their wedding, she refused to even discuss the topic. In the end, Clarence paid off the loan, but achieved nothing. By the time he realized he would never get the house money back, it was too late to file for adultery. Rumors about Kayla's adventures spread, and her authority in society suffered greatly. Friends began to avoid her, and invitations to parties, charity events, and other events dried up. To make matters worse, since she was unemployed and dependent on Clarence's money, her financial situation deteriorated greatly. Clarence learned an expensive lesson. He lost several hundred thousand dollars buying my half of the house. He lost another $28,000 due to a failed wedding. He also had to pay Kayla $50,000 in the divorce. And then there's humiliation. 
Kayla was furious that her affairs had become public knowledge and that Clarence was divorcing her in this way. She started telling her remaining friends that she cheated on him because of his small manhood. Such gossip spreads like wildfire. It didn't take long before all the women he tried to pick up at the bar were just laughing at him. He became a recluse, going only to work and straight home. His social life evaporated. Ready, Daddy? asked my eldest daughter. No father is ever truly ready to let his daughters go, but I am honored to do this for you, I replied. The doors opened and music began to fill the church. I stepped, starting with my left foot, and proudly walked my daughter down the aisle. I took a quick look and my smile grew even wider. My ex-wife was sitting in the fourth row. My wife, Marie, had her place of honor in the front row. I will join her after I take care of the last important honor for my daughter, who gives this woman as a wife. As her father, I give her as my wife, I said loudly. Love you, baby, I whispered to her, kissing her cheek before handing it to Bobby. Yes, I forgot to mention my ex-wife. No, it wasn't my idea. Carly asked me to do it this way. I turned around, walked over, and sat down next to my wife. To have and keep, in sickness and in health, in good times and bad, leaving everyone else. Carly practically shouted the last phrase. Then, beaming with a smile, she finished her vow. It was a wonderful ceremony. There was applause when they kissed at the end. I looked down from the main table. Marie was next to me. I saw Kayla sitting at a table to the side. She didn't look happy. Every time she looked up and saw Mary sitting in her place, she frowned. I noticed she took advantage of the open bar. Clarence was not invited. I don't know if he would have come even if he had been invited. My last great achievement for my daughter was complete. I walked her down the aisle, got her married, made a beautiful toast to the newly married couple, danced the father-daughter dance with my daughter, and then danced with my wife while the daughter danced with her husband and his parents to the second song. My duties were completed. I was sitting at the table next to my wife. My youngest daughter was dancing with one of those guys who was vying for her attention. Sorry, Marie, isn't it? Can I borrow your husband for this dance? I heard my wife's familiar voice behind me. Marie and I turned to face my ex-wife. Marie looked at her for a moment before answering. Just remember to return it to where you took it. She looked at me. I trust you, but I don't trust her not to do something stupid. I brought Kayla to the floor. They started playing a slow song. I wouldn't be surprised if she asked for that very purpose. I tried to keep my distance and not pull her towards me. We danced a little before she spoke. You should have given me that one night. We should have put it behind us and carried on with our lives as usual. Today we were supposed to be alone and you shouldn't have left that evening. You should have known me better not to think that I wouldn't mind you cheating on me, no matter how many times you do it. I didn't cheat. I told you this before I did it. I didn't sneak behind your back. Whether you told me or not doesn't matter. The fact that you had sex with someone else is cheating. Besides, I never gave you permission. I told you not to do it, but you did it anyway. I never wanted this. I only wanted one night and then we could be together forever. You know that you are the only man I have ever loved. There was never the slightest love for him. Besides, the sex wasn't that good. He was selfish and not even as big as you. Then why did you marry him? Because you divorced me. Of course, I didn't love him, but I liked him. After you left, I didn't want to be alone. I thought I could love him, but I couldn't forget you. I did all this shit to you because I was angry that you left me. I still loved you, but you didn't even want to talk to me. After that one night, I knew you were all I needed and I would never date another man again. So why did you cheat on him? Because he was a loser in bed. I thought I could train him, but he refused to listen to any advice. When I couldn't take it anymore, I found a couple of other guys who could actually bring me pleasure. I had no idea Carly knew anything about this. Even if I knew that she knew about all this, I would never have thought that she would throw me under the bus like that. I feel sorry for you. We had a truly wonderful marriage, but you left it for one night of mediocre sex. I think there is no chance. I couldn't stop laughing. Not just no, but hell no. 
First of all, even if I weren't married now, what you did by turning my children on me killed any possibility of us ever getting back together. Now I'm married again to the woman I love, and I have another, daughter who I love too. The best I can offer is courtesy when we are in the same place and at any events with our children and grandchildren. Fortunately, the song ended soon. I didn't talk to her again that evening. She couldn't afford to pay the mortgage on the house, so she ended up selling it and moving into a small apartment. She got enough money from the house to live on if she was careful. From time to time, she dated friends, but as far as I know, she never had any other relationships. Clarence ended up living alone, too. Carly and Bobby had a long, loving marriage. They had three children, two boys, and one girl. Josh ended up marrying a nice girl, too. They had two daughters. As far as I know, neither of them cheated on the other. There are those who believe that I should have taken revenge on Kayla and Clarence. I couldn't really do them any harm without going to jail or getting hit back. I decided to just move forward and live my life as best I could. As they say, the best revenge is a life well lived. I did so and let karma deal with the rest. Karma is a bitch. Clarence and Kayla didn't get burned, but they didn't escape unscathed either. No, I have nothing to do with this, but I still feel good. I have my wife, my daughter, and my other two children in my life again. I am surrounded by people who love me. I have a good life. Ready, Daddy? Asked my daughter. No father is truly ready to let his daughters go, but I am honored to do this for you, I replied. The doors opened and music began to fill the church. I stepped, starting with my left foot, and proudly began to walk my daughter down the aisle. My wife took her place of honor in the front row and smiled widely. I joined her after taking care of the last important honor for my daughter. Don't worry, Dad. Today I will go through this. I talked to Carly and I'll do it right the first time, Jenny assured me. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.